We've developed the Balfour Beatty Academy, which is an online training capability where technology is certainly playing a large part there. Hello everyone and welcome to the EdTech Podcast. In this series episode of the VocTech Podcast, Learning Continued, which seeks to explore the intersection of adult learning and tech. My name is Sophie Bailey and you can follow online at hashtag VocTech Podcast and at Podcast EdTech and at UFI Trust on Twitter. We love all your feedback, so if you're listening in, do ping us a note or subscribe to our newsletter to keep in touch. And finally, a big shout out to UFI VocTech Trust and UFI Ventures for supporting this series and vocational skills development in the UK through their investments and grants in vocational technology. A few listener messages before we start today's episode. First of all, congratulations to anyone who was recently nominated as part of the EdTech 50 or State of EdTech Awards, both here and in the US. Nicole Ponsford, Becky Baller and Caroline Keep from the Gender Equality Collective dialed in to tell us about the EdTech 50 evening and how it went. The EdTech 50 launch was uh, amazing Um, for me. I've worked really hard with the EdTech Collective, um, who are the group of technologists, women and men, who are doing amazing stuff in the sector. Um, I was really keen to shine a light on them. I feel that, um, well, at least since 2017, uh, the circuit has been uh, predominantly male. So I was really pleased that there were, um, I think we had about 20 um of the edtech collective technologists who happen to be women in the in it and um our partner projects and ambassadors uh the actual event was really positive great hearing from different elements um of the sector and also the networking there were people that who just wanted to hook up and can we work together and what can we do for the kids and it was fantastic that in education there is a sector really focused on closing gaps for the kids using digital technologies um personally i feel very proud uh to be part of this i was a judge this year um, and i was really keen to see that it was as inclusive as it could be and i think for edtech and the sector it makes sense for that um new technologies and inclusion to go together to illustrate the potentials that are there for us all um technology shouldn't limit and the edtech 50 really illustrated that hi i'm becky baller And I'm lead teacher for the ICT and the Digital Competence Framework at Risker Community Comprehensive in South Wales. Just over a week ago, I was at the EdTech 50 launch and I was named as one of the EdTech 50 educators. This is something was totally unexpected, but I am over the moon to have been named as such, basically for just doing my job and promoting digital skills in education to the students that I teach and the staff in my school and in our local area. What was really, really lovely was to be at the Amazon headquarters in London with an amazing view across the city to be listening to people who are just as passionate about ed tech and how we can take this even further in the future. I was there with a group of people from the Gender Equalities Collective who I met in London at BET earlier this year and who represent the very best women in ed tech at the moment and also aim to promote women and girls in ed tech in the future. There is a massive gap in the market and I am really, really proud to be doing my part to help promote this even further. Hello, Sophie at the EdTech Podcast. This is Caroline Keep from Spark Penketh and Makefest. Um, just a few words to just say hi, and I love the podcast, to that um, we're part of the Gender Equality Charter with Nick, and that you can find out more about that just by Googling Gender Equality Charter the GEC Charter and GEC Futures. Uh, if you want to have a nose at all of that, go nose. Um, but all of us absolutely love to make sure that we have good diversity and good equality in our schools and that 
people can plan and understand the the depths of which that can go to. And I personally love maker spaces. So if you've got anything to ask about maker spaces or maker ed, hands on technology in schools, then just tap me up. I'm at K A eight one on Twitter. And I hope everybody has a great podcast. I'll be listening in. Bye. Yay! Thanks, Nick, Becky and Caroline for your messages. Next up, if you're passionate about keeping the arts in our curriculums, check out this message from 100 about their visual arts and education spotlight. You can submit projects online before May. In today's society, there is an ever-expanding use of digital platforms and presence of visual content in our daily lives and work. This needs to reflect on how we prepare our students for the 21st century. At 100, we aim to improve education through impactful innovations. Along with our global partner and mobile game development company, Supercell, we are looking for visual art solutions and practices that develop self-expression and cultivate the creative thinking skills needed to succeed in both work and life. Visual arts are expressed through various modes. For example, painting, sculpting, graphics, photography, media, and cartoon art. There is growing evidence that demonstrates a direct link between an arts-rich education from an early age and an increase in students' confidence, their intellectual abilities across all learning areas, problem-solving skills, and general life skills. If you're an innovator, educator, or organization working in the field of visual arts education, we encourage you to share your work for the 100th Spotlight on Visual Arts by Friday, 15th May, 2020. Head to www.hundred.org for more information. What else? Past podcast guest Richard Taylor is wondering whether the EdTech community especially 3D printing manufacturers, can play its part in manufacturing medical goods to support patients affected by coronavirus, whilst a group of proactive educators has pulled together the resource homelearninguk.com to help educators, students and parents as they deal with new ways of supporting teaching and learning. More on both of these in our newsletter and show notes. Right, on to this week's episode where we throw back to a pre-coronavirus recording with Hector McCauley, Managing Director at the international infrastructure and manufacturing company Balfour Beatty. Hector and I chat about talent pipeline, technology and training and why getting up at the crack of dawn in your first teenage jobs sets you up for life. Following on from our chat with Hector... Ian Hurd is out and about at this year's BET and you'll hear from a range of attendees about everything from avoiding plagiarism, developing attention and calm in the workplace and skills development in AI from the UK via Israel and the UAE. Right, here we go. So I'm delighted to be on the line with Hector McCauley today, who is Managing Director at Balfour BT. So welcome, Hector. Thanks, Sophie. It's great to be here. A quick introduction to both Hector and Balfour BT. Hector is a graduate of the Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh and a long-term employee of Balfour BT. Balfour BT, for those who don't know, is a leading international infrastructure group with 26,000 employees. They finance, develop, build and maintain complex infrastructure such as transportation, power and utility systems and social and commercial buildings. Over the last 100 years, Balfour BT have been involved in iconic buildings and infrastructure all over the world, including the London Olympics Aquatic Centre, Hong Kong's first zero carbon building and the Channel Tunnel Railway Link. Today, the company employs a thousand people across Scotland and more recently, it has collaborated with Kelvinside Academy in Scotland to open Scotland's Innovation School build as focusing on real world challenges and collaborative problem solving rather than just exams and results. Um, So one of our questions we always ask guests is any jobs they've had before what they've become well known for and why they're on the podcast and uh, yeah just wondered if you had any that you'd derive some interesting skills from. (laughs) It's okay yeah well so I was at Heriot Watt University as you said in the introduction 
I, I graduated from Heriot in 1985 and, and have worked for Balfour Beatty since. So I don't have a variety of past employers. But I did, before I went to university, I did take a summer job uh, in a hospital as a domestic, oh. um, which, which was <laughs> we interesting. We could have worked together. Um, well, <laughs> it, it raised me a few pounds before I embarked on my student experience. So, yeah, um, yeah. And I, I guess looking back on it, I think, um, yeah, probably surprising how much, apart from constantly smelling of bleach and detergent, <laughs> you know, there, there's, there's probably a couple of things that, that I remember from it. And what, one of them, the, the shifts always started at seven in the morning and I had to get, uh, I had to get a bus at 6.15, so... That meant that uh, as a teenager, I had to get up at half five in the morning, which, which is a, a challenge, but has become a skill that uh, I suppose I've, I've drawn on regularly since uh, since those days. But I, I think, you know, more seriously, I, I think in yeah, you know, it was a psychiatric hospital, and in the process of of you know being a teenager in that environment, you know, I, I had the opportunity to to talk to and engage with a with a number of uh, you know of the patients that are in there, and I, I'll always remember sort of receiving some wise words you know from them, which have stayed with me. And, and I suppose the message that kind of sticks with me about that is that you know you, you should never never underestimate you know the contribution that's going to come from the most unexpected of sources. <laughs> um, Absolutely, you know, and, and the value of that. What a brilliant one! That, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very true. That's why I love asking that question. So just to begin, if I've got my stats right, you're directly responsible for a team of a thousand people across Scotland. Can you talk to us a little bit about talent pipeline and, and the training of, you know, those a thousand people in your kind of wider team? Okay, yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, thanks for the introduction. Um, in, in terms of the Balfour BT business in Scotland, as you say, uh, we have about a thousand full time uh, people working for us. Uh, and, and really, I think in construction, uh, as, as in many other sectors, I guess the most critical asset we have is our people. Um, and so the, the recruitment and, and development and retention of that talent is absolutely fundamental to the business going forward. I guess one of the main threads of how we ensure that we identify and develop that talent really is through our annual OPR process. So that, that's where we review not only the performance, but the potential of all of our staff. So through that process, we identify where individuals are in their career path, and we create individual plans then to develop them, to support them to reach that potential. And these plans are then rolled out and monitored on a twice yearly basis, you know, through PDRs of performance development reviews with line management, etc. But essentially, that that is the main mechanism by which we identify and ensure that we have a, a development plan and process for that talent. We then develop that talent pipeline by you know, identifying career pathways for them, which, which are mapped out through succession planning. So, so that then fits back into the business to ensure that we give you know, individuals a career development path with, a, with an ultimate objective at the end of it. And to what extent sort of does technology play a part in that process in terms of assessing sort of skills and performance and all the rest of it as well? Yeah, I think, well, technology is playing an increasing part in everything we do, isn't it? Both in, in training and in the industry and, I guess, society in general. I think in terms of training specifically, we, we do an element. You know, a lot of our training is, is work-based. So it's about we, we work in the 70-20-10 principle where 70% of, of development is from on-the-job learning, 20 is from coaching and mentoring, and, and 10 is, is informal uh, training programs. So I guess it's in that 10% uh, of formal training programs that we we have, we've developed the Balfour BT Academy, which is an online training capability with, with different modules uh, that people can do WebEx training, uh, you know, of interactive online training. So technology is certainly playing a large part there. I suppose we're moving away from having sit down face to face classroom type training and more really adapting training modules to, uh, to suit the context within which people are, are operating and to, to suit the you know the, the relevance to our industry really by uh, by doing it interactively on on the Alphabet Academy. 
Yeah, and I can imagine that a lot of that, there's a lot of sort of safety work that takes place. I mean, we interviewed, for example, previous guests about, you know, using VR technology for work training, which might, you know, have that kind of risk or safety element. So it's interesting how it's creeping in. Absolutely, yeah. One of our ongoing projects for for the last number of years has been the maintenance on the fourth rail bridge. And we actually train our scaffolders uh, using VR to simulate the scenarios of them trying to install scaffolding in the air above the Firth of Forth. So, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic tool to be able to train what is a safety critical operation within a, within a very safe environment. In terms of, uh, you know, there's a very well advertised discussion around sort of the skills gap and that kind of thing. I just wondered in terms of, you know, how you're getting new employees coming into the business, perhaps before they are sort of mid-career. What's the kind of mix, you know, whether it's further education colleges or universities or apprenticeships? Yeah, I think the key really is to is to get into that chain as early as you possibly can. Mm. Uh, we do We do a lot of work with schools particularly in, in the earlier years. Uh, we work closely with, with the Develop the Young Workforce uh, Network and, uh, and quite a number of schools across the country liaising with careers guidance officers, etc., trying to introduce the industry to you know, pupils early on in their career before they're starting to make subject choices. I mean, that goes from just school talks and site visits for, for school pupils right through to we do some formalised uh, class training modules. Uh, so we, we roll out a program, a couple of programs, one, one of which is, uh, is DEC, Design, Engineer and Construct, where we actually work with the school teachers to develop modules which are a combination of classroom teaching but also real industry input. So, so we put people into the modules from design, from construction, from different elements of the process to, to give the pupils some real true life Mm. scenario experiences if you like as part of that and it's a it's a program which then gives a qualification at the end of it and I guess we, we're trying to use that as the first step in introducing those those students who will then come out and either through foundation apprenticeships or the modern apprenticeship program will come and you know ultimately end up joining us and having a career in the industry mm-hmm. but it's really I think the key to it is is getting in there as early in the school journey as we can and and getting pupils and and equally their parents involved in construction and understanding what construction is. That's what I was going to say. They're disrupting the idea of what they think construction is because I would imagine it's like a whole myriad world of different jobs. Uh, Absolutely. And, you know, I think going back to your technology question in relation to training, I mean, technology is impacting in a massive way everything that we do across the industry um, and you know what what we're now doing, everything in design and documentation is is digitized where some of the traditional construction operations like surveying and setting out quantification, all those things now are done with drones. Mm. Um, so we're we're now doing so much digitally that that generates volumes of data. And really, where we're moving towards now is is predictive analytics of that data to try and predict where the problems and issues are going to be so that we can focus our resources in advance into those areas. So it's moving away from what might be regarded as traditional construction skills towards very much technology-based data innovation type skills. So it's a completely different workplace than than maybe the traditional view of, of construction is. You know, just to go back to the, you know, encouraging younger people into the industry, I think one of the important Drivers behind that, certainly for us, is is the Five Percent Club, which which is really a, you know, it's, a it's an organisation which which drives employers towards actually trying to create that critical quantum within their workforce that are trainees, apprentices, graduates at that kind of level, and you know they sign up to that and say we will have a minimum of you know one in twenty of all our workforce will be a trainee, apprentice or a graduate um, you know, and try by doing that to ensure that we have sufficient new blood coming into the industry uh, that you know the talent will flow through to our future leaders. Well, yeah, and on uh, sort of in addition to that, you mentioned the use of drones, and you know many of our listeners will be you know either education leaders or teachers from schools, higher ed, further education colleges as well, and you know some of them will be computer scientists that are sort of heads of computer science. 
you know, they're encouraging their students to tinker with things like drones. So if if they're kind of interested in how to then relate that to the world of work, do you have kind of resources for people within the education sector to kind of lean on as well? Yeah, I think what we're trying to do is through a, through a number of initiatives is get closer to the new thinking maybe that's coming through in the in the younger generations in the education centres. I mean, typically we we're embarking on a an exercise with uh, with one of the universities, particularly in, in the gaming side of things, and and. You know, I think we don't know what we don't know. So, so we're we're opening up what we do, which is, to be quite honest, in construction is is quite traditional and repetitive, and we do it that way because we've always done it that way, and we know it works. And really bringing in the completely opposite mindset, possibly of of, of people that are involved in developing gaming technology, and saying, come and look at what we do, and and just you know, push the boundaries and challenge us and disrupt the norms, if you like, and, and tell us how we could do things differently. And it's through bringing that kind of different thinking from outside the industry, from, from schools and colleges, really is, is where I think we're going to actually make some some game-changing innovations, really, in how we do things in what is a fairly traditional and conservative industry. Yeah, on the podcast, that's what we like to try and do, is connect different parts of the sector. So uh, hopefully some people will get in touch after this. So how we became connected was through Scotland's Innovation School, which if I understand correctly is a £2.5 million project to get children more connected with local industry and opportunity. I suppose this is, you know, potentially sort of outcome of that shift of mindset that you just described. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that specific project as well. Yep. Um, I, I think, you know, for us, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly small traditional construction, new build construction project, but the, the difference really was Right from the outset, engaging with Kelvin Side Academy, it was clear that they had some quite exciting ambitions in relation to the significance and, and the impact of this particular building. It wasn't just a building; it was going to have a life. And, and I think you know the excitement for us is to be involved in creating that life and being part of it going forward. So, I suppose what was different about it really was that there, there was so much engagement with the school and and the pupils throughout it that you know not only did it give the the students and pupils the opportunity to experience firsthand if you like on the job experience rather than you know looking at case studies and examples and and us creating scenarios they were actually part of the whole process from 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 start to finish so we we created you know, like shadow roles for for students where they could actually sit side by side and see what our architects were doing, what our engineers were doing and, and what the issues were and decisions, processes that had to be made. So there was real hands-on experience, which, which is absolutely invaluable, both in terms of, of their learning, but in terms of us trying to explain what work is like and what the job involves you know, in the construction sector. So, so I think it's a fantastic experience. I think not, not only... The students enjoyed it. I think our guys enjoyed to some degree the, the challenge and the attention that they got. And you know, at the end of the day, we we have across the country, you know, a number of our staff are trained construction ambassadors and STEM ambassadors. And you know, they regularly engage with schools and colleges and try and create scenarios to explain what the industry is about. But you know, really here we've we've had a level of of real life hands-on experience, you know, that's taken that much beyond what we could ever achieve anywhere else. So a fantastic opportunity. There's nothing like uh, a child asking those really basic why questions to really make you kind of think what it's about. Absolutely. Yeah. Why? why? Well, I don't know why, you know, (laughs) because I've always done it. A lot of the things we talk about on the podcast are, you know, this, the the kind of complexities between perhaps having a physical campus, you know, what we used to have as a traditional physical campus, and then, you know, how some education is shifting online. And a lot of that discussion is around sort of hybrid forms of, of the campus um, popping up. So perhaps, you know, you don't have your massive lecture hall, but you might have sort of satellite campuses around as well. And I, I'm sure this is um, the same in other industries in terms of retail etc do you sort of see this trend in your own work sort of in in terms of actually building some of these spaces and you know how they're conceived and and perhaps a change around education spaces as they're developed i think what we are seeing across probably more the the further education 
higher education sector is the need for flexibility in, in space. So, I mean, there's, there's significant investment going into states at the moment across across Scotland, and and we're building a lot of uh, of new build, which is being designed in a way that it's flexible for the adaptable needs of students going forward. So I think, you know, like technology is moving at such a fast pace, it's, it's difficult to predict today what the you know the, the educational needs will be in, in ten years' time. So so there's probably. The biggest change we see in the construction side of it is is the need to be designing far more flexible um, capability into the buildings. And finally, where do you sort of get your inspiration from in terms of, you know, whether it's thinking for your work or, you know, just thinking more broadly as well? Please, the hardest questions for last. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think the inspiration comes from the enthusiasm and drive that you see coming through in the young talent. Um, I think that, you know, looking looking back, I have been fortunate to, to have had, um, you know, some, some people putting their hand on my shoulder and, and directing me and, you know, and giving me the opportunities that have helped me, you know, achieve what I have. And, and I think, you know, the, the inspiration is, is seeing the young talent coming through and, and realising that you can actually do something to promote that talent and, you know, from an individual basis, but also from a, an industry basis to, to make the, the industry and society a better place for us all going forward. So that's the, the, the drive that, uh, that kind of makes it all happen. Well, thank you so much, Hector. And uh, yeah, it's been wonderful to uh, hear all about your work today. Thanks, Sophie. <laughs> Hello, my yes. Hello, Jason. My name is Ian. I'm from the EdTech podcast, and I was just interested to hear about what Turnitin is doing now. Because my background in FE and HE, I know Turnitin as being obviously a plagiarism service. Yep. And uh, I'm quite interested to see uh, what the developments are now, integrating with Microsoft Teams and looking at assessment made easier. I was wondering if you yeah. might be able to help. So the main aim of turning it in now is basically to just empower educators to do what they are meant to be doing, which is teaching, yep. um, identify critical learning opportunities, be able to look at potential misconduct, obviously, but also as well create efficiencies in grading and feedback. In the back end of 2018, we acquired a company called Gradescope, and Gradescope is actually a tool that is used for grading and feedback in STEM subjects. Yeah. So within that, you can grade paper-based assignments, you can actually grade computer code, check yeah. similarities in computer code, um, and you can also do things like um, to create dynamic rubrics, um, and you can also That's use interesting. AI. A, a dynamic that. rubric? Yeah. Basically, it's a totally new concept, really. So instead of having a preset rubric, what you do within Gradescope is you can, as you're grading, let's say a maths question, yeah. and you can say, okay, this person is missing the integral, or this person is missing the constant. Instead of having that preset, because you don't know what the mistakes might be, you can create that as you go, and then you go, okay, this person's missed off the constant, okay, minus one point. And then the main idea behind that was that traditionally that would be paper-based, and if yeah. you decided halfway through the grading process that you decided that one point was a bit harsh, you only wanted to deduct half a point, you'd have to go back, scribble out all the answers, change the grades. With that, what you can do is you can decide, okay, I want to only minus off half a point, and it'll change that for everybody. So it creates fairness in grading. And we're trying to do that with Feedback Studio as well, by having rubrics that you can share and comments that Hence you can share Hence the generative well. part yeah, of it. Yeah, so just to make it feedback and grading way more consistent and fairer. So that sounds like a really good idea for formative assessment. Yes, and that's yeah. where we're trying to move into a lot more. We've always been able to be used for formative assessment. It's been yeah. more the fact that people didn't know they could. So with our platform, with Feedback Studio, we allow unlimited submissions, for example, for students. The main reason being is that the more time somebody submits and the more feedback they get in that writing process, the more they're going to be able to develop, be able to you know, start getting critical thinking skills. So yeah. having all of that in place means that they can actually do that through the process and then then when they go to submit that final piece, they are already have gone from point A to point B with a huge increase in knowledge yeah. and, and techniques in their writing. It sounds great. And how does it integrate with Microsoft Teams? So we have a new platform which we're using for our future products. And 
Microsoft Teams integrates with our product Turnitin Similarity and SimCheck. Basically what that will do is it'll be similarity only and within Microsoft Teams you create your assignments, student submits and then when they get that submission the instructor can then look and they can see what the percentage is, they can then open up the full similarity report using our new Cloud Viewer as well which is yeah. really cool. Um, and the student can see it as well, which is nice. Yeah, so it's just integrated a bit like a sort of plug-in. Yeah, exactly, within yeah. So the same as what we have, similar to what we have in Moodle yeah. and, and Canvas and the other platforms. Yeah. Just obviously Microsoft Teams being a much newer kind of new age VLE, let's call it. So it's a brand new integration for us to, to showcase. Yeah. Well, it's great. So thank you very much for your time. And I will pass that on to our listeners. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks, Absolute Jason. Pleasure. This looks good. Yeah. The Sen Egg. So the idea with these is uh, they're multi-purpose units so we can adapt them uh, to different uses. So this one's a gaming one. We've got relaxation, sensory. You can have it for video conferencing. Whatever you want, we can adapt it. Just for our listeners, this is like a pod. It's single a single user. pod, single unit. So single, one person user, goes yeah. in there and they can be, you know, experiencing so an immersive one, Yeah, the experience. idea is it, they've got the, the favourite games console in here. We'll be able to have a look now, actually. Oh, here we go. We've got someone exiting. Did you enjoy that? Yeah, it was really good. Wow, it was brilliant. really intense, but in a really good way. <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Do you mind if I... I'm, gonna, I'm going in. This is, uh, this is interesting. So the idea is we've got interactive lighting, which is based on okay. video content. This is a very comfortable seat. Yeah, so the, the sound and everything is obviously coming from the video or the computer yeah. game. There's vibration in the seat, so it makes it really immersive experience when you play your computer games. The ones next to us, uh, for relaxation, they've actually got scent machines and wind machines. So okay. it's a different pre-programmed content on that one. Yeah, okay, so they're, uh, they're kind of modular, they come Yeah, yeah. Uh, so again, in an office space, we can adapt it for a single-user video conferencing. Or you could have it for your movies at home or just a, a music pod. So it could be for many different types yeah, exactly, of situations, yeah, yeah. couldn't it? The idea is we can adapt it to your, your need. Yeah. I love the idea of having sort of this in the workplace. Where yeah, someone can go that's what we just... say, well-being, yeah. Yeah, yeah relaxation. well-being, rax- relaxation or to engage with yeah. any kind of like, you know, sort of compliance yeah. learning or something Sometimes, like that. you know, we all need to switch off from the environment. can be quite noisy. Just go somewhere to read some emails, something like that. This, this one's got touch screen as well, so there's yeah. lots of options we can do for you. I've never seen anything like it. No, it's no, really... it's a new thing to the market, yeah. I've always thought we need something like yeah, yeah, this, yeah. you know, in the workplace, which yeah. is, you know, private for someone it's to go and have a... It's a big thing is well-being, so I think we're going to see more things like this. There's yeah. no reason why you can have something like this as a re- the relaxation pod, you know, just before you go to I want one of these or... for my house. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're designed to go through a normal doorway. They're the standard yeah, for them, so they, yeah. you know, they could go. They, they are on wheels, so, yeah. It's a special needs. Some people yeah. maybe get terrified of going to the doctors, so we could create content which would play sound or video to set the scene of being in the doctors, just to calm people down. So there's no real surprise or shock what might be going on there. I guess that's why you've kind of called it the same egg, really. Yeah, it's sensory the main egg, focus. Yeah, yeah. It's a sensory egg. Multisensory. And uh, so, where can people find out about this? So this is Os1 Technologies. Uh, As one. Yeah, that's all one word. Os1 Technologies.co.uk. We're based in Northern England. We ship worldwide. We've got a US branch as well. So. <laughs> We can, we can help you, everybody out, really. Brilliant. And did you start in the UK? In yes, the we UK? did. We've been around 20 years. We started uh, making computer systems, and we've grown from there. We do sensory environments. We do a zone touch screens, a zone uh, visitor management systems. So we do a wide range of products. Oh, this is really fantastic. Yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> I'm here with Itamar. Can you tell us a little bit about your natural language processing technology? Uh, we're aiming to uh, test people via test that takes 10 minutes and measures the way a person speaks English, a student, a candidate, whatever it is. Our algorithm analyzes the recordings of a person that speaks, and by that we're able to give the person a grade oh, right yeah. the way on the, yeah, on the speech so level. they get a grade that's aligned with the CFR? Yeah, yeah. CFR uh, is the European framework yeah. uh, of reference for languages. Yeah. Basically, uh, a standard, a European standard for languages, and our technology is aligned to the CFR. So you were telling me, it's quite interesting, you uh, uh, so you start off in uh, Jerusalem, is that right? You've been yeah. working a lot in India. And... Uh, we started in Jerusalem. We sit in, uh, in an office there, and we started uh, reaching out to the biggest universities and HR companies that might be uh, potential customers for the product that we uh, developed. And uh, we got uh, to one big university, and two, uh, the biggest HR companies uh, in Israel used our product. And uh, we got uh, to India. With mindset, it's an excel- Israeli accelerator that took us there, and uh, we're looking forward to, to expand our services to Asia, the U.S., 
all the call center and BPOs, big universities worldwide. So you're just yeah. focusing on the speaking. It's yeah, highly yeah. Specialized. We focus. We focus mainly on verbal abilities of people. So what do mindset do? Who do, who else? Do they like, uh, they it's accelerate. A, a, it's an a Israeli organization. Different... Okay. That is based on that uh, is being funded by private organizations and companies, and basically the accelerator helps workforce education and other companies to globalize their services. Yeah. We're trying to learn from each other and grow and improve, and uh, we're doing it very well. Yeah. yeah. I hope so. Many companies, many call centers, many support centers are based outside of the, the, the headquarters of the company. And uh, we're trying to make the communication better between the companies and the end clients. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're uh, improving this whole procedure of recruiting and, uh, and finding the best people that suit to the position that they're searching for. So you can use it as part of a recruitment tool? Yeah. That's really interesting. That's what yeah. we do. Uh, one, like, th- that's not a long vision, a long-term vision. No. Uh, we but you are, work with schools and universities as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, if you want to get accepted to a program and the, pro- like the, the specific school that you're trying to uh, uh, get into wants to, uh, to know what, what abilities you have in English, they will send you and you will do our test. Send you a link, sign up online, start it, 10 minutes, you're done. And uh, the conservative solutions are good, of course, but uh, we have a very specific goal, a very specific aim on, on what we're doing, and we're trying to be the best at that. Well, it looks great. I love the interface. It's very clean, very easy to understand. Thank you very much. It's lovely. It looks really fresh. Thank you Brilliant. very much. Thanks for talking to me. And Thank uh, you. My name's Ian. Yes, I'm from the EdTech Podcast, and... Uh, and Dr. Omar? Yeah, yeah. I'm in the course, of course. We were just with the uh, Department for International Trade, and they were talking about uh, the UAE and their focus uh, and their interest in, uh, in AI in education. Yes. We're uh, focusing too much on AI now. We too much? Trying, yeah, because it's in the future now. Right. Yeah, the AI. So we're trying to prepare uh, our students for the future from now on. Right. So uh, in schools now, we are using the robotics, so as we uh, try to convert from normal teaching to digital to using AI even in uh, following the students up we have yep. virtual classrooms we have uh, curriculum for AI for uh, space now also so we are trying to think uh, 30 years above not in the, what will be happening next year we are trying to think 30 years what will be happening yeah. so we are preparing our students for that yeah. through our schools and I hear you've got an, an AI minister yeah. <laughs> yeah we have now an AI even application to evaluate yeah. the level of the students without any human interfering. That AI system, it will analyze the question, the answers of the questions of each student, and according to that, it will increase or decrease the levels of the questions, or even focus on some questions that the students is low in those skills, like reading skills or critical thinking skills. So the systems without any human interfere. Oh, you're assessing critical thinking skills? Yeah. Oh, wow, that sounds really interesting. Yeah. So, like, uh, looking at uh, yeah, we semantics. Are, we are and using it now, and it will be launched in the whole country in March. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's amazing. Yeah. That, that sounds yeah, really we great. We have also a national competition in uh, robotics and AI. Yeah. yeah. It's a very big competition. Thousands of the students are comparing in building robotics to do a certain task from uh, cycle one to cycle three. So even the small students, they have to participate. And they have bought with us many projects has been done by our students. And we are proud of that. Yeah, and, and I was hearing about the, uh, sometimes you put out uh, to tender from, you know, from other countries, from the EdTech community as well, about you know, uh, uh, certain tasks that you yeah. have that are, are of interest. What, what, have you done any of those recently? What were they yeah. focused on? Well, you know, we have teams that are participating in the international competitions. And... Uh, one of our teams last, they went in the VIX Robotics. They are one uh, are the best uh, innovation team in that one. And uh, also now we are uh, even involving the environments. Wow. We are caring about the environments. Our government uh, is caring too much about the environments because our kids in the future, they will live in this environment. So they have, they have to take care about it. So they are trying to build now submarines and some devices and robotic devices to explore the oceans and explore the area and help, uh, help us to improve that. 
through gathering data and analyzing that data with AI, of course, yeah. to help and improve and put a better plan for the future. But uh, the AI is uh, AI is present to help us. Yeah, yeah. tech yeah. for good. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> now, for example, we have many jobs that has been taken by the AI. Even uh, government jobs like uh, firefighters. Now we have drones, we have robots to firefight us without uh, human interference. But it will create also a new uh, kind of jobs. Yeah. Yeah. But we have a critical thing here to think about, to have the skills for the future for that. Yeah. So we have to teach them and learn them how to have the skills for the robotics for the in the future so that they have a good jobs, a good uh, place in the sure. future. Which is where the critical thinking comes yeah. in. Yeah, absolutely. I'll leave you to your... Uh, I see you've been teaching thank something. You I'll leave you to that. But thank you so much for talking thank to me. Thank you very much. This all looks very interesting. Yeah. I wonder if you might be able to tell me what VDX Blockchain Solutions is all about. What do you know about the blockchain? A little bit. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> so the blockchain, as you know, has been used, in, used mostly for crypto, right? And crypto um, works because of three properties that blockchain gives crypto, which is money is traceable back to an origin. It's not like cash, right? You can you just don't get to pick up a banknote, you know where it comes from, where it has been. It doesn't yeah. work like that in crypto. And since it's distributed, you also get the other properties, which are uh, the blockchain being immutable between the many nodes and being there forever because nobody controls it. So these are all three concepts that are very interesting for data. And this is where Visidox comes in and tries to partner with universities. The idea is that we, we partner with universities when, for, some, for example, someone finishes a diploma and the university gives them a, a diploma, they do that through us, putting the diploma on Visidox. And the right. idea is that once it's there, it gets, it gets these very three, uh, the, the three interesting properties, being immutable, being there forever, and being traceable back to an origin, which in this case is the university. So what happens is if the student goes to an employer and wants to prove he actually has an authentic certificate, he actually did the training for it, verifying this will be very much easier. Instead of uh, having to do a lengthy process, they can just verify the credentials on our platform. Uh, it's more than a certificate as well, isn't it? Because yeah. I suppose there's metadata in there that explains okay. about what, what, what does the metadata include, what other information. You're very perceptive, that is correct. Uh, the idea is that the metadata that is interesting for one university might not be, or an entity could be different from what metadata is interested for another university. So we tr we work with each specific university. We do a bit of a you know bespoke. That, that's why we know, you'll see on our website bespoke blockchain solutions because we tailor made each solution to every of our partners. So if they want a bit more data, like you said, on the certificates that has a student name, watch how well he performed, not just completion, for example, you know the grade, everything, all that. Who taught that course? At those kinds of things, you'll actually be able to see as granularly as you'd need for that specific university. So that's that's a case by case basis. So it could include things like soft skills and information about that as well. You know, Correct. More kind of rich data, like you say, granular data for. Yeah, it could include that, those kinds of things. It really depends on you know the education provider, what they they want to say about a student, or what the student wants to be said about them. I, but I suppose that's between them. We're just enabling. Um, the traceability and accountability of these certificates and credentials back to the original university and of course the student who actually has them, right? Yeah. So both can use the platform, um, staff members and the students and, the, and even then the employers uh, will also be able to use the platform to verify the credentials on them. So it's a way to be centralized. And can these credentials and the information contained within them be analysed by third parties, or maybe by LinkedIn or people like that, to scan for potential candidates for jobs and things like that? How it's, does it work like that? It's a very interesting idea. At the moment, since we put uh, the responsibility of managing uh, the data to the, the people who actually own it, in this case the students, it really depends on them to what to do with said information. If they want to put it on LinkedIn and make a link available, look, go ahead and check they actually have it. They can use our platform, put a link there, and it'll be it will show everything that it's verified, it's traceable back to the university that they yeah. actually issued it. And so So that will be it'll be searchable essentially. Well yes, this is searchable mostly by the university at this point, but it's something definitely we we can make available more publicly if needed. Well it looks really fantastic. So good luck with it all. Ah thank you very much. Thank <laughs> well, you for stopping by.
Thanks for listening, everyone. Huge thanks to my guests, you for listening, and UFI Voctech Trust for supporting. That's all for now. Stay safe, and until next time, bye-bye.